APU. American Public University is proud to present the following podcast. Welcome to the School of Arts and Humanities at American Public University System. My name is Dr. Bjorn Mercer, and today at the Everyday Scholar, we're talking to Dr. Trevor Reed, Associate Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. And today, we're going to be talking about changing careers from music to law. Welcome, Trevor. Hey, thank you for having me, Bjorn. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited to talk to you today. We've known each other for, gosh, two years now or so. And we've always talked to music. We've talked a little law, and now we're going to talk about your experiencing and changing careers. And so this leads me right into my first question for you, is what was it like to change careers after completing your PhD in music? You know, it's a good question, because I'm not sure yet if what I've done is really a career change, and I'll explain that a little bit. But I think what I've found is that what I'm doing now is kind of an intersection between things I'm passionate about, things that I enjoy doing. I feel incredibly lucky that I have a place to do that. But in some ways, I also feel like I've been going down kind of a well-traveled path where people have found a way to carry on multiple professional lives. Think about all the composers out there that have packed back and forth between various professions, you know, like Charles Ives, (laughs) who went into insurance sales as well as composing, or Philip Glass, that was a plumber and a taxi driver for a number of years while he was composing or performing. And there are plenty of lawyers I know that are also really good musicians and continue to play. In fact, one of my law professor colleagues here at ASU, Charles Cagueros, is a really top-notch drummer and performs flamenco, or at least performed flamenco for a while, while he was early in his teaching career. So I don't know if I necessarily call this a career change, but more of kind of my professional life. But jumping into the legal field full bore after being a music PhD is kind of a bit of a shock. I mean, it's a different type of a world, different formalities, different hierarchies, different ways of viewing the world. And so, yeah, you know, it has been a bit of a, an adjustment in the way that I go about doing my work and even the content of the work that I do. But I really, I think about it as kind of a fusion of two of my favorite things, two of the areas that I'm passionate about. Excellent. I really like that you brought up Charles Ives specifically, being one of my favorite American composers, and the fact that his career was insurance. And then on the side, he wrote amazing music, especially, I guess you could say, in the early 20th century. And that's one thing that you have in common with Charles Ives, is you are also a composer. And so as kind of a follow-up question for that, how, and we'll get to this a little later, but how do you still incorporate composition into your life now? Absolutely. One of the challenges with doing the legal profession is that uh, it definitely consumes a lot of your time, right? The creative time that I used to have, the time away from the desk while I was doing writing, even for academic stuff, I had space to be able to do the writing, the musical writing that I wanted to do. As I found, though, there's a remarkable relationship. Maybe it's not a direct connection, but there are similar expressive things about music and law. So in some ways, I look at my work in the legal field as a mode of composition. The notion that you have to persuade a judge is kind of similar to the way that you persuade audiences to keep listening as you're writing a piece of music, right? So I think there are a lot of connections there, and they actually involve similar processes intellectually for me. And even I found ways to incorporate creativity, composing into the research that I'm doing right now with Indigenous people as they're trying to use music as a way to assert their rights in society at large. Excellent. I don't know if you listened to one of my previous podcasts with Jonathan Hill. And he talked about music of indigenous people in American popular music, which was an excellent conversation. Now, do you find that because of your music background, that also helps you talk to or build rapport with people? I think there's definitely some of that. Being an attorney requires quite a bit of interpersonal interaction. And I think being a musician, one is always perceptive of the way other people perceive the work that you're doing, reading social cues, things like that. But I think there's also, you know, a certain amount of pride that one has in one's work as a lawyer and as a musician. You know, nobody wants to be told that they're not towing the line, they aren't playing their Brahms sonata correctly. Nobody wants to 
have a judge throw out their brief and say it's garbage, right? So I think they're both professions and they're definitely things where we take pride in our work and there's a lot of individual merit involved when we're doing our work. And we're definitely rewarded as individuals on both fronts. But yeah, I think there are definitely connections between these two in that way as well. Excellent. The next question I have for you is what was it like being a parent while you're in school becoming a lawyer? (laughs) And then how do you now juggle, of course, being a parent while you are a lawyer? So changing careers in law school, very difficult. And then now now that you have the job, you're still a parent (laughs) and you're still having to juggle everything. Sure. It's wonderful to have kids. It's also challenging and hectic, as you know. And especially currently right now, as many of us are under quarantine or else are not able to move around with our kids, we're at home a lot. And it definitely makes you appreciate the work that parents do. But I think having kids really keeps you real. To be honest, it forces me out of this professional world that I assume every day. And it makes me have to understand somebody else's world. I have to understand the problems that my kids bring to me, the things that they show me. It helps me open up new perspectives that I wouldn't otherwise be attuned to. It also ensures that I'm efficient with the things that I do do at work, right? It makes me confine my schedule to a certain time period. And Without having the responsibility of family, I could dwell on a particular legal issue for hours and hours trying to solve it. And I think having the kids around helps me to see, well, you know, there could be different points of view. And then sometimes I'm taken completely away from the things I'm thinking about, which is a lovely opportunity that not everybody gets. One of the things that I found super useful about having kids, if I could think of my kids as being utilitarian bonus, right? Is that as an anthropologist, kids help you get into places you wouldn't normally go. (laughs) This is one of the fun things. I did a lot of my field work as an ethnomusicologist out on Indian reservations. And, you know, kids do and say the darndest things. And so they would go up to a particular elder or a particular individual strike up a conversation or perhaps they'd do something embarrassing in front of an entire village and you'd learn all kinds of things from that experience. And so I felt like my kids opened new doors. They helped me to get into situations I wouldn't have expected and to learn things that I wouldn't have otherwise learned or poked my head into. So I think they also have things to say about situations that open my mind, both legal issues and also musical issues and also just just my general work as a scholar, anthropologist, researcher. So kids are wonderful in many ways, <laughs> as you know, as you know. Yeah. Now, do you find that in music and in law, and just as you talked about, time management is extremely important. In law, is there more of an emphasis on working longer hours? And is it the individual to figure out the time management? Because one could easily be consumed with one's music career, say, practicing, practicing. And with law, probably with uh, researching. Absolutely. The music professional, we're often paid, if we don't have an institutional job, we're paid on a project-by-project basis, right? You've developed a grant to do this amazing artistic work, and then you'll get paid for it in a block uh, of some funding, or else perhaps you'll be able to publish it, and the publisher will give you an advance of some sort. When it comes to law, you're generally paid on an hourly basis. And so the more hours you work on a particular issue, the more billable hours you acquire, the more investment you make, perhaps the bigger the payoff. Now, of course, in the law, we want to represent our clients the best and we don't want to gouge them at all. But the goal is to solve the problem, whatever it takes, up to whatever the limit your client might be setting. So perhaps the incentives are a little bit different. You know, when it comes to musical creativity, the goal is to do it on a budget, often. (laughs) When it comes to legal creativity, we're talking about doing it in a way that hits the highest level. I think that definitely pushes folks to work long hours. I know a lot of my colleagues that I went to law school with, they go to work at 10 a.m. and then come home at 2 a.m. We're talking about very, very long days. And that's kind of just the culture of the legal industry. And uh, there are many musicians that put that kind of strain on themselves. But I think just to be able to perform and to be creative at that level, one needs to take breaks. So yes, it's definitely a different culture and different work ethic. 
Now, since COVID-19 or coronavirus is currently (laughs) in the country, in the world, and we're all experiencing it collectively, how do you see musicians being impacted? I would say more the gigging musicians versus the academic musicians who maybe have full-time jobs. And how are lawyers impacted by this? And say differently. I think, and this is kind of one of the tragic aspects of the current situation. I was just reading in the New York Times today that the Metropolitan Opera has had to let go all of its musicians as part of their effort to be able to control costs and also to allow folks, I'm sure, to be eligible for unemployment benefits. And I think this is going to end up probably being the trend around the country is that how can these employers that employ musicians, how can they really pay musicians when there are no audiences that they can tap into. This has been one of the challenges, I think, for the music industry for a long time, is that in-person performance has, for at least since the early 2000s, been kind of the mode of making the most money in the music scene. I mean, there are ways now to stream and to be able to receive royalties through digital downloads and things like that. But by and large, having access face-to-face with musicians and performers has been been a major source of income. And there are certain art forms that we just haven't really developed a mode to stream them well. It's difficult to bring two performers together from different places in the world and stream them perfectly. There are new software platforms to do that, but we really haven't developed that culturally uh, as an institution yet. And so I think definitely the music world needs to evolve to make it possible to do more electronic collaborations. Now, the legal world has been doing this for many years. You know, I, I worked at a firm in Washington, D.C. that had offices in many parts of the country. And when it comes to Native American law, that was the law that I was working in at the time, tribes are spread out all over the country. And so to be able to have those face-to-face interactions and also have as many legal minds together as possible, you have to connect digitally. And so I was in D.C. and I was working with attorneys in Alaska and in San Diego and in Albuquerque. And you can take your work home pretty easily because the end product really is a a text document, you know, and you can send that document to all over the world and it can be read and enjoyed. I don't know how much it's enjoyed, but it could definitely be ingested and used. So I'm not sure culturally if Definitely in the legal world, culturally working across digital links is is definitely accepted. But I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where artistically in-person culture can be used and experienced online in the same way that it could be experienced in a performance like a concert hall. Certainly, audio recordings and podcasts are becoming a, a norm of everybody's life, but I think we still have that longing to have that social experience when we go to the concert hall. Right. And I completely agree. It's difficult because I could sit here and listen to Bruckner Symphony No. 8 and love it. Absolutely wonderful recording. But listening to that same symphony in a concert hall is a completely different experience. The visceral, I guess, reaction your body experiences in that live performance is you just don't get it. Even in one of the, say in a perfect recording or with the perfect audio setup. So music and especially classical music, and I should say both Trevor and I are classically trained musicians. It's difficult because the economy of classical music is really, like you said, really live. Do classical musicians even make any money anymore? I mean, with recordings? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, what a challenging world it is right now for the classical musicians in general. It used to be that the symphony gig was kind of the pinnacle, what everybody was aspiring to. But how many full-time symphony orchestras can really support that level of fixed costs anymore. That's one of the biggest challenges facing the field. How do we employ these incredibly talented people full-time? Remarkably, though, I think there are some connections to the legal field, even though a lot of our legal creativity, our legal work, our legal profession can be done online and remotely. 
we definitely insist on performance in the legal field. Oddly enough, sound actually plays a significant role in American law. Think about the sound of a gavel, the announcement of a jury verdict, the preference for oral testimony in a trial, or even oral argumentation, which is supposed to help a judge at resolving complex issues of law. It's the jury's duty to hear all the evidence. And we hear imperatives to call your legislative representatives. We have debates and speeches. We have campaigns to let your voice be heard. There's this deep connection. At this time, we're talking to Dr. Trevor Reed here at The Everyday Scholar, and we're going to take a quick break. The public service field offers satisfying ways to make a difference to people and their communities. At American Public University, you'll have the chance to learn great tools and strategies from highly experienced leaders, as well as develop the knowledge to create effective policies. Get the expertise you need to make changes to your community or even the world. Apply now at study at apu.com. And welcome back to the Everyday Scholar here at American Public University System. And we're talking to Dr. Trevor Reed, Associate Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. And my next question, Trevor, is how does your Hopi background influence your choices in life? Well, I think this is a good question. I've been pondering over this a bit in my own life now that I've moved much closer to the Hopi Reservation. New York, it was quite distant. So, you know, I didn't have a lot of contact except for the summers when I would come out and and assist the tribe with legal issues. But um, I think now that I'm much closer, it's made me realize just how close of a connection I've had. Uh, I didn't really grow up on the Hopi Reservation. I grew up in Seattle for the most part, but my dad, who is Hopi, often sang Hopi songs to me. And I traveled to the reservation to witness ceremonies, of course. There was a period in my youth when my family moved to the reservation for a while, and that was deeply impactful. Music and singing is really important in Hopi society, and so it was just natural that that kind of just became integrated into my practice as a musician and then into my interests as somebody interested in law. But, you know, it's interesting. My movement from being a composer that was interested and fascinated with Hopi music into a person who works on legal research that involves Hopi issues around sovereignty and sound, I think that kind of happened by accident, to be honest. While I was studying music as an undergraduate, I remember I was writing a piece that was kind of, it was Hopi influenced. And I remember presenting it to the faculty as part of my grade in a class. And I remember after the performance was over, one of the faculty raised their hand and said, oh, you know what? That sounds just like Pocahontas. (laughs) I thought to myself, you know, I thought indigenous culture is unfortunately highly stereotyped and very much undervalued in our creative industries today. And so I decided, you know, I needed to pursue something a little bit more than just composition. I wanted to pursue training in arts management to see if I could develop a career promoting and producing arts and culture. And so that took me to New York, to Columbia University, where I actually met Aaron Fox, who's the director for the Center of Ethnomusicology there at Columbia, who explained to me that they actually at Columbia have this massive archive of Native American music. It's just been sitting there for the last 70 to 80 years, and nobody's really touched it. But there's this historical, incredible document of creativity from tribes from all over the world. And, you know, it made me think, wow, why is this here? And I came to understand this history that for almost a century, and even beyond that, ever since the advent of sound recording, people have been going out to indigenous communities to record their creativity. People have seen it as remarkable and different, and sometimes exotic, of course, and they brought it back, and and it's been an important part of Americana, an important part of our cultural development. And these materials are here, and the question is, now what do we do with them? Who owns them? What rights do people have to those? So naturally, that just took me into the realm of copyright law and indigenous rights and trying to understand the answers to some of these questions. So in in a lot of ways, my Hopi background has definitely taken me on this journey. I feel a certain amount of obligation to support the Hopi people because that's who I am. But at the same time, I feel like it's also kind of led me along a path where I've embarked on a career that wasn't really possible just as a composer or just as a lawyer, kind of made a fusion of these interests of mine and taken me down this very interesting path. 
It's a remarkable path, I must say. And I guess a follow-up question for you, which is a difficult question. I've lived in mainly West Texas, mainly Arizona. And so having lived in these areas, there's always been tribes around me. But then I say, as your average American, without any native that's part of me, I know very little (laughs) about the history and the true culture of the indigenous people of uh, North America. Why do you think that is, that the American education system fails at teaching its own people about indigenous people here? And how can we do better? How can we learn about the people who were here before Europeans came over? Is it through music and food? (laughs) Is it through reaching out? Is it, I don't want to say help because that can, that's tricky. So I I definitely agree that we, as a society, uh, American society needs to know more about the people whose land we're on. And I think that statement itself uh, helps us to know why we don't learn as much as we do. And we think about the priorities. What is it that we want children? What core understanding do we want them to have to be functional in American society? We don't usually turn to, well, we need to understand indigenous ownership of this land. We don't need to understand necessarily indigenous sovereignty to be able to function within a United States civil society. In fact, when you look at the Constitution, indigenous peoples are only mentioned once, and it's only in the context of commerce, right? Congress is given the authority to be able to make laws with respect to commerce with Indian tribes. There's no deference to indigenous laws. There's no acknowledgement that this land belongs to indigenous peoples. And so part of the project of settler colonialism, uh, what we refer to as the way that settlers have arrived on this land and then essentially taken over control of it, the whole logic of that is dispossession through erasure, right? We take for granted in our society that this land has other sovereigns on it. And we do that both overtly by making that explicit when we say we base our entire legal system off of this constitution that was never ratified by indigenous peoples. And we also do it kind of more overtly. We do it by simply not acknowledging that other people have lived here and had societies and still do. And then, of course, it's also in the way that we narrate these societies. Whenever you see on television or in social media, whenever you see an indigenous person, statistically, that person has either committed a crime or is impoverished. It's very rare that you see an indigenous person that's successful, that has means, that's being creative or making a difference. And that's slowly changing. I think we're starting to see a few more indigenous peoples that are seen as real creators, innovators, CEOs, things like that. So why has our education system failed to display indigenous peoples in a more positive light or even teach their histories? I think one is we don't have enough time to teach everything in our curriculum. And so some of the first things to go are the things that people feel like aren't relevant for a society that's based on dispossessing indigenous peoples. Now, at the same time, I think as a society, we've also kind of cordoned ourselves off from indigenous peoples. The whole notion of a reservation, for example, came from this idea that we should reserve portions of land for indigenous peoples to live on. And that whole structure of reserving land for indigenous peoples to be on, the underlying theory was that indigenous peoples would stop existing at some point in time in the future, that they would either assimilate into mainstream society or that they would just die out, the whole notion of social Darwinism. We haven't seen that happen. In fact, we've seen indigenous peoples thrive despite the fact that there are reservations set up in this manner. But the whole idea was to cut off indigenous peoples from the rest of society until they were able to intermingle. And I think that the separation has really placed a distance both intellectually and culturally between indigenous peoples and what we might call mainstream society. You don't necessarily see that in other places. You don't see that necessarily in some places in South America or in the Pacific Islands where there are different arrangements, where there aren't necessarily borders that keep people separated. So what can we do going forward? Well, I think 
The biggest challenge here now is to simply find ways to give voice to a, a more diverse group of intellectual, cultural leaders. And I think we're starting to do that. I think the other piece is being able to accept the different worldviews of different societies. One of the big challenges that we have is that a lot of times indigenous worldviews are incommensurable with the kinds of structures we've developed. Indigenous relationships to land are very different from the kind of relationships to land that are espoused by American society. And yet, increasingly, we're starting to see overlaps, similar approaches. One of the most interesting legal innovations that I think have happened in the last few years is the recognition of personhood rights for rivers, streams, mountains. You know, those are some cities, some counties, even some states and countries are saying, oh, that mountain, uh, we're going to give it personhood rights. It's going to be treated like a legal person. And if somebody violates it in some way, then you can actually sue that person on behalf of the mountain or the stream. These are worldviews that indigenous peoples have held for a long time. And now they're just barely making it into our legal system. So yeah, I think I think there's a lot that we can do as educators. I think but a lot of it happens at some of the more fundamental levels, being able to integrate indigenous philosophies and indigenous ways of looking at things into just the core subjects that we have and that we teach. No, thank you. Learning more for Americans about indigenous culture and being, to me, is one of the great, I'll say, challenges because we need to do it as a country. There's many things <laughs> that we could say that uh, Americans need to improve on, America needs to improve on. but. To me, this is one of the big ones. So thank you. So my final question is, uh, since you changed careers with a family in hand and a PhD completed and you, you went and got your law degree, what advice do you have for working adults as they're changing careers? Say they had one career and they're transitioning to a new one. What's the advice? The biggest advice I would say is to not necessarily leave the career that you previously had behind. It's important to take time when you're moving into a new career to really soak up everything, to really learn the ropes, to be able to integrate yourself. But I think there are many bridges that we can make between different fields that aren't there already and that we can kind of be leaders, especially when we have disparate fields that we're traversing. I think about the types of connections that I'm making in my research between music and between law, not just in terms of copyright law and how we can better protect music, but even between just the structures that we have. You know, music and law are actually pretty similar on a number of levels. Think about the way that music and law are both deeply connected to our social experiences. I don't think anybody doubts that the social impacts of law, especially currently right now, law is what's, aside from the concerns we have for our neighbors and loved ones, law is definitely what's influencing our willingness to be behind uh, the doors of our own homes and not out there circulating in society. But, you know, music also does many of these same things. If you think about the way music influences our behaviors and things like that. So I think, yeah, one of the first things I would say is don't feel like you have to leave behind everything from the prior career. You can integrate and you can be a thought leader in many ways through the connections that you're making. I think the other piece of advice would be definitely have patience. <laughs> uh, this is one of the things I'm learning now is that even in academia, just moving from one college to another can be just learning an entirely new culture, an entirely new system, and a new way of being and thinking. And that can be a little bit challenging. It might feel stifling at first, but I think fortunately there are ways that we can make those bridges happen, but you know, it takes patience. It takes us looking for opportunities and not doubting ourselves. So I think that would be the next piece of advice is that have patience with yourself and don't doubt that the contributions you're making and, and your steps forward are uh, in vain. But yeah, I think beyond those two, just keeping the eye out for new opportunities, I think is, is also a really amazing thing that comes from changing careers, seeing new things through new perspectives. Perspectives, I think, has been really eye-opening for me that I can actually combine music and law in ways that I never thought I could. 
and people are interested in collaborating with me that I never would have thought I would be collaborating with. <laughs> I thought moving into law, I would be giving up any sort of creative or performance art. And it turns out that I have colleagues in, in the humanities and the design institute and the music school that are all also working on these really interesting social issues that dovetail between law and the creative arts and humanities. So I think the field is open. I, I think we have many possibilities. And so uh, career change doesn't necessarily mean sealing oneself off anymore. No, thank you. Those are Absolutely wonderful points of advice. And and I completely agree. Patience, don't discount what you have already done. And be open to opportunities. I mean, that's one of the things I tell people is uh, try not to discount any opportunity that might come along. And and you never know when something's going to happen. And that's why you should try to be ready and try to be open to it. So no, thank you, Trevor. Uh, This has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. And any last words? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Bjorn, this has been great. And I'd love to um, continue to collaborate with anybody that's interested in the career change question, because I think all of us that are in this position have a lot to learn from each other. So hopefully there'll be a way for us to collaborate going forward. Excellent. And of course, you are listening to The Everyday Scholar here at American Public University System. My name is Dr. Bjorn Mercer, and we are talking to Dr. Trevor Reed, Associate Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. And this was Changing Careers from Music to Law at the Everyday Scholar. For more information about our university, visit us at study at APU.com. APU. American Public University.